Welcome back once again to HeroQuest fans. I've been told to fix my sound. I've been trying. So please bear with me as I try to do the stream uh, until I can get a better microphone set up. So thank you everyone for tuning in. We're getting started a little bit late here, as you can imagine. But that's okay. Do what we can. All right, so what I've been working on lately, um, of course, we had the holidays, and so I did some other stuff for a while. But what I'm working on now is I'm repairing my uh, Battlemaster set. I printed out some replacement stickers, and I'm applying the stickers where stuff was missing and repairing some banners, and there's quite a few other broken pieces that need repair, and so I'm kind of tinkering with those, trying to work on them. But uh, what I wanted to share today, something a little special. So I've done these read-throughs of the HeroQuest rules. I've read through the North American rules from 1990. And I did a comparison video where I read off the remake rules from 2021 and compared them with the European EU rules from 1990, so the UK second edition. And those videos can all be found on the in the usual place on YouTube home of HeroQuest fans. But today, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to read off a new collection of rules here, new from 1991, actually. And these rules are actually from the Japanese version. So this was released in 1991. And what fans have done is they have translated them into English. Now, a lot of this uh, work was done originally on the yield in forums. Various people worked on it. I think it was 2013, 2014. And the original, let's see who did the original translations. Some of the people had a background in, in Japanese because um, you got to you know Japanese and English to be able to translate it. Um, but a lot of it was done with Google Translate, which as we know is not the best. So it's not going to be perfect. So if you're a native speaker, you may think that choices are a little questionable, but it's kind of the best that we could do at the time. I say we when I talk about the forum community. I wasn't involved in the initial round of it, but as time went on and they were editing and changing things, updating things, I did give feedback. So the original people that worked on it were uh, Jackie X, Fenrin79, Blue Sun, Bob Bob, that's Bob-Bob, -Bob, and Aaron B, or Iron B. Not sure how to pronounce those names always. Yeah, it was 2013 to 2016 that the forum members worked on this. So the goal was to translate the previously unknown to English-speaking audiences Japanese version of HeroQuest, because there was only one released in 1991. It was the equivalent of the game system. There was no Keller's Keep, no Return of the Witch Lord, no unique expansions. But it was unique in, in various ways. I mean, it had some new... Art designs, the rules were quite different, as you'll see. And so what I'm going to be reading through are, are the rules. But more recently, uh, Hispas Argon on the Yolden forums went through, and his goal was to take the translations that people had done and kind of refine it a little bit, update it, match it with as much as possible the original artwork, and try to retain kind of the charm of the original without trying to convert it to something else. So what some people did, uh, Bastion Bucks did one where he took the Japanese translation, he converted it to the North American rules. And he added a little bit of his own story stuff. And there was a little bit of a thing where he left the forums and went somewhere else and he took it down. And I think it might appear on Board Game Geek. Uh, that's what he said. But I haven't really kept up with all of that. And my goal is not to cover any drama or anything but um, suffice to say if if you want to play the game according to the Japanese rules you can do it even if you don't speak a word of Japanese and this is not going to be a perfect translation but I, I really like it I think it's interesting to see the differences I think it's um, you can certainly play it according to the European rules or the North American rules if you choose or you can try to play it as it was intended. So I'm going to go through these, and this is just a printout. This is just a 
a fan-made fan translation. It's not official in any way. Um, but anyway, I'm just going to show that to you. So all that, all that uh, prep. Let's see here. I'm just going to adjust the camera so that you can see this a little better. It makes a little more sense, I think. Okay, now obviously this little uh, binding wouldn't have been there originally. This would have been a booklet similar to the European version in black and white. So this is the translation. So reading the rules of play. HeroQuest rules of play, Japanese edition. And I'm not going to do a Japanese accent. I do have my sweet tea here. So if you've... Let's see, do they have sweet tea in Japan? I'm sure they do. I always think of bubble tea. But that's completely different. I've never been to Japan. If you have, uh, feel free to share your thoughts. Let's just check. See, nobody's in the chat yet. That's okay. This may be a little dry, but I'll try to keep my voice going. Okay. Hero Quest rules of play. One day, four heroes were summoned by the king of Neef Island. This is the beginning of Hero Quest. I just want to say a lot of this stuff is, I mean, like with any translation, it's not going to be one to one. There's editorial decisions made along the way. So uh, I think some of the early translations, they said Nifan Island, which makes you think of Nihon or Nippon, Japan. But anyway, um, I'll try to keep the editorial stuff to a minimum. I'll try to just focus on this is his Bazaar Gun's particular arrangement of the translation. And he solicited feedback from other people on the forums, like how does it flow and, and so forth. But anyway, okay. One day, four heroes were summoned by the king of Neef Island. This is the beginning of Hero Quest. What's in the box? One game board, one quest book, 35 plastic figures, rules of play, screen. One warrior, one magician, one elf, one dwarf, one gargoyle, four, four dark warriors, three mono lizards, eight orcs, six goblins, two mummies, Four skeletons, two zombies, one evil god. So yes, the Chaos Warlock is now called an evil god or false god. The Chaos Warriors are called Dark Warriors. Femurs are called Mono Lizards. There's the screen. All right. Uh, and the, of course, the Barbarian is now called the Warrior. The Wizard is called the Magician. All right, 15 pieces of furniture. Two tables, two bookcases, one cupboard, three treasure chests, one alchemist bench, one fireplace, one throne, one altar, one tomb, one torture table, one weapons rack. Furniture pictures are shown in the screen. 21 doors, five closed and 16 open, 64 cards, eight monster cards, 21 treasure cards, 18 equipment cards, Three Earth Spells, three Water Spells, three Air Spells, three Fire Spells, five Legendary Treasure Cards. So again, I'll try to keep the editorial commentary to a minimum. I'm not going to be going over the cards this time, but Legendary Treasure Cards are what the Artifact Cards are called in this one, or what would have been called Quest Treasures in the EU version. Okay. 60 Character Sheets, four Character Boards, one Warrior, one Magician, one Elf, one dwarf, two dice, four combat dice, rock tiles, six, one square, two, two square, six pit trap tiles, two collapse tiles, falling block traps, four secret door tiles, one stair, stairs tile. There's a picture of a combat die and a character sheet. He even translated the character sheet and the character boards. And some items must be assembled before starting the game. The detailed assembly method is explained on the next page. And so this is 1991, developed with Games Workshop, Milton Bradley. Uh, this is their game. Uh, this is a fair use review, of course, of the rules, an interpretation of the rules. So that was page one. So page two, assembly. Be careful not to lose the small components. Be careful of components with sharp points in order to avoid injuries. 1. Carefully remove the hero and monster pieces from the plastic sprues. 2. Assemble the gargoyle as follows. A. Fit the wings to the back as shown. B. Fit the head to the neck as shown. 
3. Carefully punch out the screen from the die cast sheet. 4. Remove the door bases from the gray sprue. Punch out the doors from the die cast sheet and attach them to the bases as shown. Assemble the open doors in the same way. 5. According to the illustrations on the back of the screen, remove the parts of the alchemist's bench, bookcases, cupboard, and torture table from the brown plastic sprue and remo remove the tomb part from the gray plastic sprue. Also detach the matching cards from the die cast sheet. Bend the card parts and insert into the underside of the plastic tops as shown. 6. Remove the levers from the brown sprue and attach them to the sides of the torture table as shown in the picture. 7. Remove the bottles from the gray sprue and attach them to the top right side of the alchemist bench as shown. Also remove the scales from the brown sprue and place them on the alchemist bench as shown. 8. Attach the rats from the brown sprue and the skulls from the white sprue as you like, such as in the holes of cupboard and torture rack. 9. Remove the altar and candles from the gray sprue. A card part isn't used for the altar. Carefully fit the two candles into the altar holes. So already you can see a few differences here. All of this normally is on the inside of the box. In this version, it's part of the rules in the rule book. 10. Remove the weapons rack from the brown sprue. It does not need to be assembled. 11. To assemble the throne, tables, treasure chests, and fireplace, remove the rest of the parts from the brown sprue. Also punch out their cards from the die cast sheet. Be careful with the small pins. A. Throne. Insert the two pins into the sides of the throne, trapping the folded card between them. B. Tables. Insert the long single pin into both sides of the table, trapping the folded card between them. C. Treasure chests. Using your finger, bend the card to fit the curve of the treasure chest. Insert the pin into both sides of the treasure chest, trapping the card between them. D. Fireplace. Bend the card to match the plastic base, then insert. 12. Punch out the remaining card parts from the die cast sheet. That was page 2. Page 3. Finally, introduction. Introduction. Roman numeral 1. Game overview. One player becomes the Demon King of Darkness, Grim Dead, abbreviated as the Demon King below. So no Morkar, no Zargon. It's the Demon King or Grim Dead. And the rest of the players become heroes, a warrior, a magician, an elf, and a dwarf. HeroQuest is not a game in which the players compete amongst themselves for first place. It is a game where the party, the term for the team made by the heroes, works together to resolve quests, go on adventures. If they clear a quest, the party wins. But if they don't, the Demon King wins. The heroes grow stronger while completing the 14 quests one by one, or else they die along the way. The Demon King controls monsters and attempts to stop the heroes clearing the quests. Also, he aids gameplay by checking the quest book and reading out quest objectives for each of the heroes and checks whether traps are encountered or not. The conclusion of the game is not revealed here, so by all means, you must discover it for yourself. The game difficulty is divided into three levels related to progression through the quests. Chapter 1, The Departure, Quests 1 to 3, Beginner Rules. Chapter 2, The Mission, Quests 4 to 8, Intermediate Rules. Chapter 3, The Search, Quests 9 to 13, Advanced Rules. Final chapter, The Showdown, Quest 14, Advanced Rules. So already you see a drastic change there. To begin the game, you can play just by learning the beginner rules. The players proceed through the quests, learning the intermediate rules after the first chapter ends, and the advanced rules after the second chapter ends. Warning, do not open the quest book until after roles have been chosen. Roman numeral 2. Number of players. The game can be played by two to five players. Just get a swig of tea here. Roman numeral 3. Basic concepts to play the game. Character abilities. 1. Body points, BP. Maximum body points, max BP. BP is linked with a character's strength. It decreases when receiving damage in combat 
or from a trap, and the character dies if it drops to zero. Lost BP can be recovered using magic or medicine, but it cannot be raised higher than the character's max BP. When the heroes level up, their max BP increases. Two, mind points, MP. Maximum mind points, max MP. MP is linked with a character's wisdom. Characters die if their MP drops to zero. At the beginning of the game, MP does not have much use, but it becomes necessary in the quests in the latter half of the game. MP cannot be raised higher than the character's max MP. 3. Others. Movement, attack, and defense will be explained later. Note, if a hero dies if either of their BP or MP drops to zero. That's page 3. On to page 4. Introduction. Contents. A. Game board. There are squares and white lines on the game board. Characters stop in the center of these squares. The white lines are walls. Walls cannot be moved through. The game board is separated into rooms and passages. Note, when this rulebook uses the term adjacent squares or neighboring squares, these terms mean the four squares in front, behind, and to the left and right. The symbols circle in diagram A show squares facing orcs. Okay. The term surrounding squares means the eight squares in front, behind, to the left and right and diagonally adjacent. The symbols circle and diagram B show surrounding squares containing orcs. Okay, so diagram B surrounding squares, diagram A adjacent squares. So that's how this quest book defines everything. B, character boards. Character boards show each hero's characteristics, attack, defense, movement, body points, and mind points. C, character sheets. Character sheets are used during gameplay to record each hero's current status. When you begin the next quest, you start with a, the status displayed on the character sheet. Basically, the character sheet records a hero's growth. So there's character sheet. You'll notice uh, it's, it's a different arrangement than the European version or the North American version. Actually, there were several European versions. There was the original version, and then there was the one released with the Adventure Design Kit. So this is completely unique. And it actually lists out the quests by name instead of just numbers or just saying tasks completed like the other versions. So interesting stuff. Okay, first, give your character a name and write it on the character sheet. Next, look at the character boards and write down your character's type. Maximum BP, BP, maximum MP, MP, attack power, and defense power. During the game, whenever these values are raised or lowered, write the new values on your character sheet. You will need to change these values at times, so it's best to use a pencil and rubber. It's a rubber eraser. During your adventure, write details such as the gold you've obtained, and weapons you've bought onto the character sheet too. Every time you clear a quest, tick its checkbox. So there again, it's a low resolution image, but there you go. So that was page four. Page five, try to go a little quicker here. Introduction. D, the quest book. 14 quests are contained within the quest book. The Demon King runs the game by following the quest book. He must never show it to the heroes. The quest book is mainly split into four sections. So there's the image of the quest book. You got one, two, three, four. And spoilers, of course. The quest book is mainly split into four sections. One, dungeon map. These maps have symbols showing the monsters that the Demon King can move and their starting positions. The maps also have symbols showing the locations of furniture, dead ends, traps, hidden doors, and treasure chests. The Demon King must place monsters, furniture, and other objects on the board as the heroes move around the dungeon in accordance with the map. Which symbol mark represents which item of furniture is written on the back of the screen? 2. The Book of Adventure The Book of Adventure contains the objectives of each quest and the rewards obtained when they are cleared. Before playing the game, the Demon King reads from this book to the heroes. So in the other versions, this section is called the Parchment Text. Just letting you know. 3. Quest Rules Each quest has its own rules. 
Before each quest, the Demon King should read the quest rules carefully. They must not be read to the heroes in advance. The quest rules explain the contents of treasure chests, events that happen when the heroes reach certain rooms, and the actions that the heroes should take. 4. End of quest. So I guess the quest rules would be called quest notes in other versions. 4. End of quest. The endings of each quest. Explain what is learned when clearing each quest and the story connecting to the next quest. When the heroes clear a quest, the Demon King should read this section to them. E. Screen. Okay. This is used so that the heroes do not see the quest book and other items. The Demon King sits behind the screen and places the game board so that the words Hero Quest can be read from his position. This is a list of furniture on the back of... There is a list of furniture on the back of the screen, sorry. F. Combat Dice. Use these in combat when defending and when a level up occurs. When you need to roll five or more dice, roll two times. Because they only give you four dice in this version, just like the EU. The North American version came with six combat dice. And of course, there's two red dice in every version for movement. All right. In the explanatory text and on the cards, they are abbreviated as CD for combat dice at times. G, monster cards. The monster cards show the monster's abilities. There is a card for every race of monster, and each card lists that race's attack, defense, movement, body points, mind points, and the gold obtained when defeating them. So there's a change there. That was page five. Moving on to page six of the Japanese rules, 1991. Let me just check, see how we're doing here. All right, introduction. And this, this once again is uh, page six that we're on. Okay, for you following along at home. H, legendary treasure cards. It is said that there are five legendary treasures in this world. To be able to clear the final chapter, the heroes must obtain all of them. The locations of each legendary treasure are shrouded in mystery. Are they found in treasure chests? Or are they being carried by terrifying monsters? More details can be found in the quest rules. These cards must not be mixed with the ordinary treasure cards. See page 13. I. Other cards. How to use these will be described as necessary. Roman numeral 4. Game setup. 1. Deciding roles. Before the game can begin, players must each choose their own role. Everyone should roll a die, and then each player chooses the role they wish to play, beginning with the player who rolled the highest number and then going in order. If nobody has chosen to be the Demon King when it is the last player's turn, the last player to choose automatically becomes the Demon King. When there are less than five players, players must control two or more heroes each. However, the Demon King may not also control a hero. When roles have been decided, the heroes each take the following items. The plastic figure for their character, the character board for their character, a character sheet. The Demon King takes the following items. The quest book, the plastic figures for the monsters, the furniture, doors, treasure chests, and similar items, the cards, the tiles for traps and secret doors, the screen. Note, the Demon King Grimdead has no plastic figure or character board. 2. If this is your first time playing this game, the heroes must write certain details on their character sheets. See the character sheets section on page 4. 3. Setup. Just getting a little bit of tea there. Cheers, dead gamer. All right. Setup. This section remains the same for the beginner rules, intermediate rules, and advanced rules. 1. The Demon King begins by checking the dungeon map and placing the stairs tile on the hero's starting position on the game board. In certain quests, the starting position is something other than stairs, and in these cases, do not place the stairs tile on the game board. 2. The Demon King reads the Book of Adventure to the heroes to let them know what they should do. Next. The Demon King should read the quest rules silently. 3. The stairs are the entrance and exit of the dungeon. The heroes place their plastic figures on the squares adjacent to the stairs. When there is a special starting position, follow the quest rules instead. 4. The Demon King places the contents, furniture, etc., of the room the heroes start in. They must not place any other areas yet. 
placement is described on page 9. All right, moving on to page 7. In, uh, beginner rules. So here's the next section. Chapter 1, Beginner Rules. By learning the beginner rules, you can play at Chapter 1. In the beginner rules, only the monster cards are used. Also, tiles for traps and secret doors are not used. The beginner rules are the basis of the rules of the entire game, so be sure to read them well and understand them before playing. I would, just as an editorial side, I would point out that the European version has its own beginner rules that it uses on the very first quest, which is either the maze or the trial, but then it has the full rules for everything else. The Japanese version does it differently. It, it splits it up into sections, as you can see, as you will see. Okay, Roman numeral one, turn order. Play begins with the player on the immediate left of the Demon King and proceeds around the table in anti-clockwise order. When all the heroes have taken a turn, the Demon King takes his turn. On a hero's turn, the following actions can be taken. Move. Movement is described on page eight. Combat or magic. Combat is described on page nine. Magic is described on page 11. The player can move and enter combat or use magic in any order they desire. However, they cannot use some of their movement, enter combat, and then use the rest of their movement afterward. Also, even if a player does not use all of their movement in one turn, it does not carry over to the ne their next turn. If a hero steps into a new passage or room, the Demon King places doors, furniture, monsters, and other objects according to the map. Placement is described on page nine. And just for reference, we're on page seven right now. For those following along at home. On the Demon King's turn, when the Demon King's turn comes, he can move all of the monsters currently on the game board in whatever order he likes. He does not have to move all the monsters if he does not want to. Each monster can take the following actions. Move, combat. Monsters can also move and enter combat in any order they desire. The end of the game. Play continues until the heroes escape from the dungeon or die. The game ends when there are no longer any heroes remaining on the game board. If the heroes achieve the objective listed in the game book of adventure, they clear the current quest. However, they must leave the dungeon alive. If a hero stands on the stairs tile, he can escape the dungeon. Monsters can never stand on the stairs tile. Returning alive is the most important part of raising a character. There may be times when you have to run away again and again without having completed the, text, the quest adventure. But do not worry. Even if you do not complete a quest, you can challenge it as many times as you wish. See when returning on, or sorry, see when starting another game on page 11. Okay. So moving on to page eight of the Japanese rules here. See, it goes a lot quicker when we're not switching back and forth between different versions. I'm just trying to save my voice here. So beginner rules. This is page eight. Roman numeral two, what can be seen? In Hero Quest, what range on the game board can be seen by a player's figure is very important. All figures and furniture in the same room as the player can be seen. Passages can be seen down so long as there are no turns. When on a square adjacent to a door, the room or passage on the other side of the door can be seen. See diagram one for examples. So here we have diagram one. Got one, two, three, four, A, B, C, D. All doors are open. From A, passage one can be seen. From B, passages one and two can be seen. From C, room three can be seen. From D, passage one and room three can be seen. From E, room four and passage two can be seen. Okay, so that's pretty self-explanatory. Roman numeral three, movement. How to move. Movement distance. Movement distance is measured in squares. The furthest distance a character can move is his movement. Before moving a hero, roll the number of dice listed under movement on his character sheet. The total of the numbers on the rolled dice is his movement. As long as characters do not exceed their movement, they may move as many times as they want. They also do not have to move at all. 
Monsters have their movement specified on their cards, so they do not need to roll dice when moving. Rules of movement. Neither heroes nor monsters can move diagonally through squares occupied by enemies to squares occupied by another figure. Because of these rules, there are times at which characters may be unable to move. See diagram two for an example. There's diagram two. You cannot move through squares occupied by enemies, so the elf cannot move to the X. Elf's dice roll. So he rolled a six. And so there's the elf. So he can go up past the wizard. He can go around the orc. He can go this way, but he can't go that way because there's an orc block in his path. And he can't go through that other orc. That makes sense. Nothing different there. Okay. What heroes can do while moving? Heroes can do the following actions during movement. Open doors. Pick up treasure. Doors. Heroes and monsters have to go through doors in order to go into and out of rooms. A hero can open a door by proclaiming, open the door, when on a, an adjacent square to the door. If they do not want to open a door, they can still pass by without opening it. Movement is not used up when opening a door. If a hero still has movement remaining after opening the door, he can continue moving. Monsters cannot open doors on their own. Once the door is open, it cannot be closed for the rest of the game. All right, page nine, beginner rules. When a door is open, the Demon King picks up the closed door and places an open door in its place. When a door is opened, the Demon King must look at the quest book and place what can be seen beyond it, picking up treasure. A hero can obtain the contents of a treasure chest by proclaiming, open the treasure chest. Win on a square adjacent to the treasure chest. See, so that's different. In the Amer North American version, you could just be anywhere in the room. So you got to move up to it. The Demon King then informs the hero of the contents of the chest. The hero who obtained the treasure writes onto his character sheet what he has discovered. Movement is not used up when opening a treasure chest. But when a treasure is obtained, the hero cannot continue moving even if they still have movement remaining. Monsters cannot open treasure chests. Placement. The Demon King's role. How to place. Nothing is to be placed on areas of the game board which no hero has yet entered. The heroes enter these areas by moving. When a hero enters an unknown room or passage, the Demon King temporarily stops the hero, looks at the map, and places doors, furniture, monsters, treasure chests, and other objects in it. Note, if the heroes continue on with quests without defeating any monsters, there may, there may rarely be times when there are not enough figures for additional monsters. If this occurs, use figures of other monsters not being used in their place temporarily. Dead ends. The symbol, that shows a little rock, fallen rock thing. Um, on the, the symbol on the map denotes a dead end. So in the North American version, this would be the single blocked, like stone wall square. The European version used the falling block as a dead end. Okay. The moment this square comes into a hero's view, the Demon King must place a rock tile on the board. Squares containing rock tiles cannot be passed through by heroes or monsters. Monsters may not pass through the squares which contain rock tiles before the tiles are placed either. You have reached the end of the rules for movement. If a hero has not yet entered combat or used magic, he may enter combat or use magic. Roman numeral 6, combat. You can only enter combat against enemies on neighboring squares. You cannot enter combat diagonally. Combat occurs in the following order. Attacking the enemy. First, the attack against the enemy is decided by rolling the combat dice. Roll the amount of dice listed under attack on the character sheet, or for monsters, the monster card. The number of skulls that are rolled is the hero's attack power. If no skulls are rolled, you cannot attack at all, so the enemy has no need to defend either. If one or more skulls are rolled, the enemy must defend against the attack. Enemy's defense. Now you'll notice he chose to use the uh, European spelling, uh, English spelling. Um, British English, I guess, is the proper term. Uh, the enemy's defense. When receiving an attack, roll the amount of dice listed under defense on the character sheet, or for monsters, the monster card, to determine the defense power against the attack. 
For heroes, the number of white shields that are rolled is their defense power, and for monsters, the number of black shields that are rolled is their defense power. That's chap uh, page nine. So yeah, as you can, as you're beginning to see, this is not just a Japanese translation of the European or UK rules. It's actually a different type of game. HeroQuest was translated into many different languages and released in many different countries. And most of the time, when you find HeroQuest in uh, another country, it's going to be using the European rules or it's going to be using the North American rules. But clearly, in this case, you've got something completely unique. And this is why I've been so excited to read this. So let's move on to page 10. And actually, this book is still not that long. It's um, about the same length as the other books. It just uh, I'm just taking my time here reading it, so it's all nice and clear. It's about 23 pages, 24 if you count the back cover. Okay, page 10, beginner rules, continuing Japanese rules, 1991, Hero Quest. Damage calculation. When receiving an attack, damage is calculated as follows. Damage equals attack power minus defense power. For each point of damage done to a character, he lose one body point. If the defense is more than the attack, the damage is zero. If a hero receives an attack, he must decrease the BP on his character sheet by the amount of damage taken. If his BP drops to zero, the hero dies. Monsters with one BP die as soon as they receive damage. Monsters with two BP will never die unless they receive two or more points of damage in one attack. Even if they are dealt one point of damage, their BP is restored to two by the time the next hero attacks. See chart one for examples. Chart one. So we've got goblin attacking dwarf. Attack power zero. So he got a white shield and a black shield. No need to defend. Attack was zero, so no need to defend. Failed, failed to attack the goblin. I guess that'd be failed to attack by the goblin, but anyway. Mummy attacking magician. So he gets two skulls and two white shields. Attack power two. Defense power one. So he gets one white shield, one black shield. Notice how they shaded out the ones that don't really count. Attack two minus defense one equals one. Mummy dealt one damage to the magician. Elf attacking orc, one BP. I kind of wish they'd done this in the other versions because this, this really explains it well, how it works. Elf attacking orc, one BP or body point. Attack power two, two skulls. And then defense power zero. He just gets a skull and a white shield, so nothing. Attack two minus defense zero equals two. Elf dealt two damage and defeated the orc. Warrior attacking dark warrior. Two body points, two BP. Attack power two, so two skulls. Defense power one, it's one black shield. Attack two minus defense one equals one. The dark warrior can't be defeated by dealing only one damage. So you see that? So the certain monsters have to take two damage in one blow to be uh, defeated. Dealing with combat results. Depending on the results of combat, proceed as follows. If no attack takes place, or no damage is dealt to the enemy. Nothing happens. Play continues as is after combat. If a hero defeats a monster, the monster is removed from the board. The hero who defeated the monster receives the money listed on the monster card as a reward. Combat ends after adding the money to the hero's character sheet. So as you can see, you get bounties for killing monsters. That was something in the other versions that I think only occurred in one quest. where you got bounties for each, each monster you killed. If a hero takes damage. If a hero has BP remaining, the hero continues playing as is after combat. If a hero dies, the dead, the dead hero is removed from the board. All the hero's gold and belongings are removed from the game. You have reached the end of combat phase. If you have not moved yet, you can move. That's page 10. Just take a quick look here. Okay. Continuing with the beginner rules, this is page 11, Roman numeral 5, beginner magic. Under the beginner rules, only the magician can use beginner magic. Only one type of magic can be used under the beginner rules. 
It is also written on the back of the character board. First aid. Magic that can be cast on yourself or an ally. The hero who has this magic cast on him recovers 1 BP. Now, I just want to say there's no actual card for this first aid, but for fun, I created my own, and I don't have it right now, but in a future video, I... I well, actually, I think I did, I did show it in my homebrew video, but I may do one on the Japanese cards, because the cards are different, and the cards actually detail some more roles that are not necessarily mentioned here. So there's some interesting stuff there. Okay, casting magic. On the magician's turn, they may use magic instead of entering combat. Magic can be cast on yourself or another target, which can be seen. Magic can be used as many times as wanted during the game. See that? So it's not just a single use for a beginner, at least. Roman numeral six, when starting another game. Before starting a new or previously challenged quest, restore the hero's BP and MP to their maximum values. However, note that when challenging the same quest again, all of the monsters that have been defeated are replenished. The player must use a surviving hero or create a new character to play. Roman numeral seven. <laughs> Revival. If a hero unluckily happens to die, he may be revived, but only once. By donating all of the gold he held to a temple, the hero is revived exactly as he was just before dying. The players who wish to revive themselves must write that they have zero gold on their character sheet. Revived heroes can be used in following quests as normal. You've reached the end of the beginner rules. So, it's a different way of handling uh, characters dying there. So, page 12. Intermediate rules. Chapter 2, Intermediate Rules. Even more difficult quests wait in Chapter 2. Players must learn the intermediate rules to play Chapter 2. The intermediate rules add various additional rules onto the beginner rules. Gameplay under the intermediate rules. As well as monster cards, treasure cards, and equipment cards are used. In general, rules are the same as the beginner rules except for the additions of the parts labeled in bold. The magician and the elf can now use intermediate magic. Heroes can choose to take one action out of each of A and B. A, move or use a heal potion. That's move or use a heal potion. B, combat, magic, or search. The order of the two actions from A and B does not matter. Dungeons have traps hidden in them. There are hidden doors in dungeons. There are hidden treasures. The dwarf can disarm traps. You can use equipment, such as weapons and armor. If you save up gold, you can attempt to level up. Roman numeral one, intermediate magic. Types of magic. In chapter two, the magician and the elf cannot use intermediate magic. The following two types of magic can be used in chapter two. They are, all, they are also listed on the back of the magician and elf's character boards. Healing. Magic that can be cast on yourself or an ally. Roll four combat dice, and the hero this magic was cast on recovers BP equal to the amount of white shields that are rolled. And again, there's no unique cards for these by default. Holy Flame. Magic to attack one enemy. Roll two combat dice, and the enemy receives damage equal to the amount of skulls that are rolled. However, monsters on which you cast the spell can roll a number of combat dice equal to their MP, that's mine points, for defense. Undead monsters have zero MP, so this magic is very effective on undead monsters. Note, undead means monsters with no life force, animated by dark powers, meaning skeletons, zombies, and mummies. Choosing magic. During the game, the magician can use both types of magic. The elf can only use one type of magic per quest. Before playing, the elf must decide which magic he choose, wishes to use that quest and write it on his character sheet. So there you go. So different types of magic, different combinations. Okay, page 13. Intermediate rules. Casting magic. On their turns, the magician and the elf may choose to use magic once during the turn instead of entering combat. Magic can be cast on yourself or on a target you can see. Under the intermediate rules, 
you may each use magic as many times as you want. Okay, so that, yeah, again, um, the, the spells can just keep being used over and over again under the intermediate rules. Roman numeral two, search. There are hidden doors, traps, and hidden treasures in dungeons starting from quest four. On their turn, heroes may choose to search for them by searching instead of entering combat or using magic. Types of search. The following two types of search can be done. Treasure search, to check whether there is any hidden treasure. Trap search, trap searches can find hidden doors and all types of traps. If a hero decides to search, he must decide whether he wants to conduct a treasure search or a trap search and announce this to the demon king. Players cannot do both types of search at once. Treasure search, range of a treasure search. Treasures are only hidden inside rooms, so treasure searches can only be done inside rooms. So just for reference, I haven't read it yet on, on camera, but the first edition of HeroQuest allowed you to search inside passages, aka corridors. But all of the versions, you only search for treasure inside rooms. So that's the same here. How to do a treasure search. Get a little T there. One. When a hero declares a treasure search, the Demon King looks at the map and checks if there is any treasure hidden in the room the hero is currently in. 2. If something is found, then award the treasure to the hero conducting the search, as stated in the quest rules. A treasure search cannot find traps or hidden doors. 3. If there is no treasure in the room, then the hero conducting the search draws one treasure card. Treasure cards will be described in the next section. Treasure cards. If there, are no, if there is no treasure in a room being treasure searched, draw one treasure card. Before drawing a card, shuffle the cards well. The treasure cards contain the following. Treasure, gold, jewels, six cards. If you draw one of these cards, write the money onto your character sheet and discard the card, placing it to the side of the treasure card pile. Page 13. Okay, yeah, so as you can imagine, the assets for the game, the game components are pretty much the same as other versions, but some of the cards are different. So there's some new cards and there's some that are missing from other versions. So this is page 14, intermediate rules. Various medicines, seven cards. These cards are placed in front of you and can be used whenever you decide. Each card contains instructions on how to use it. These cards can only be used during the quest currently being played. After they are used, discard them, placing them to the side of the treasure card pile. If cards are not used during the quest, return them to the treasure card pile. So, as others have pointed out, the North American version is the Potion Hoarder edition because you can keep potions from quest to quest, whereas the other versions, you got to turn them in if they're not used at the end of the quest. Traps, three cards. Follow the instructions Follow the, inc the instructions states on the card, then return the card to the treasure card pile and shuffle it well. Wandering monsters, five cards. If you draw one of these cards, a monster appears. The monster that appears attacks the hero that drew the card once. Because it is a surprise attack, the hero cannot defend themselves. After attacking, the monster vanishes. Return this card to the treasure card pile. So you can see wandering monsters are very different in this version than in the others. Trap search. Range of a trap search. A trap search can be conducted to find hidden doors and traps placed in passages in rooms. At any one time, you may either search all the passage that you can see or a single room. If you can see both a room and a passage or multiple rooms, then you must choose and declare which part you want to search. See diagram three for an example. So there's diagram three. All doors are open. From A, room three can be searched. From B, passages one and two, or else room four can be searched. From C, one out of passage two, rooms three or six can be searched. From D, rooms five or room six can be searched. So you can see that there. How to do a trap search. One, the hero declares which area he can see in that he would like to conduct a trap search. Two, when a hero declares that he is conducting a trap search, the demon king looks at the map 
and checks whether there are hidden doors or traps hidden in the area being searched. Three, if something was found, place the hidden door tiles or trap tiles onto the board. Hidden doors and traps will be explained in the next section. Trap searches will never find treasure. That was page 14. Now I am going a little bit slower in some of these sections, but mainly because I want you to be able to kind of let it sink in and see the differences here. Because yes, they're explaining it in exhausting detail, probably in more detail than the, in the European version, but there are quite a few differences. Some of them are subtle, some of them are more, uh, more serious, more pronounced. And I don't mind if when you play this back, you do it at, you know, 1.5 speed or whatever, whatever's comfortable for you. So here we go. Page 15, intermediate rules. Japanese version of Hero Quest here. Roman numeral three, hidden doors. Hidden doors are escape routes hidden in walls. Hidden doors should not be placed on the game board until they are found with a trap search. By using hidden doors, you can get to areas you may not otherwise be able to. Both heroes and monsters can freely pass through hidden doors. Hidden doors can be discovered from the inside. Sorry. Hidden doors can be discovered from the inside or the outside. Once a hidden door is placed on the game board, it can never be closed. Roman numeral four. Traps. Three, tri three types of traps exist, which are as follows. Pit trap. Collapse. Trapped treasure chests. Traps appear on the board when either found by a trap search or when a hero passes through the trap square. The Demon King must tell heroes of traps as soon as a hero passes through the trap square. A hero caught in a trap is stopped and must follow the rules of the trap. The hero's turn ends even if they have not yet finished moving or entered combat. Monsters will never get caught in traps. Monsters can freely move through traps Monsters can freely move through squares where traps are hidden, but after the trap tile is placed on the field, must follow the same rules as the heroes. Pit traps. When discovering, when discovered in a trap search, pit traps stay on the board as an obstacle. The trap square may not be passed through. When caught in a trap, a hero that falls in a pit trap loses one BP body point. When their next turn comes, they can move normally, but cannot conduct a search while in the pit trap. That's different. Also, when attacking or defending from a, in a pit trap, use one combat die less than usual. Pit traps stay on the board as an obstacle. Pit traps may not be passed through. Jumping over a pit trap. Pit traps are an obstacle blocking the way, but heroes and monsters can jump over them. When jumping over a pit trap, follow, follow the following rules. You can only jump in a straight line. You can only jump over one square. The other side must be empty. You must have enough movement to reach the other side, including counting the movement for passing the pit trap. Characters must roll one combat die when trying to jump. If they roll a skull, the jump fails, and they are stuck in the pit trap. Their turn ends, and they must follow the rules listed in the previous section under when caught in a trap. If they roll anything other than a skull, they may continue their turn. If they have movement left over, they may continue to move. That's the end of page 15. On to 16. Intermediate rules. Collapse. When discovered in a trap search. Collapse is a trap where an enormous rock and rubble fall from the ceiling. The collapse stays on the board as an obstacle. The collapse may not be passed through. When caught in the trap, the hero that activates a collapse loses two BP, or body points. The hero is sent back one square in the direction he came from. If there are no open squares next to the collapse, the hero dies. If the hero survives, he can continue moving normally on his next turn, but may not pass through the square within the collapse, or I'm sorry, but may not pass through the square with the collapse. Trapped treasure chests. And notice there's no section for spear traps here. Trapped treasure chests. Some treasure chests are trapped. The rules to follow when activating these traps are explained in the quest rules for the quest. To avoid getting caught in these traps, you must conduct a trap search before opening the treasure chest. If a trap is discovered, the Demon King informs the heroes what sort of trap it is. When the treasure chest trap, then the treasure chest trap automatically disengages. Let me just get a little uh, swig of tea here.
Enigma numeral 5, the dwarf's special ability. The dwarf has the ability to disable traps while moving. Each time the dwarf moves, he can disable one trap. He can disable pit and collapse traps. To disable a trap, he must be on an adjacent square to the trap he wishes to disable. The disabled trap is removed from the game board and may be passed through freely. The dwarf does not use up movement when disabling a trap, but his movement that turn ends after disabling a trap, even if he has movement remaining. Roman numeral 6. Equipment. When a quest ends, the heroes may use the gold they have obtained to buy equipment. You can purchase equipment after quest 3 in chapter 1 ends, before quest 4 in chapter 2 ends. Or, sorry. Let me read that again. You can purchase equipment after Quest 3 and Chapter 1 ends, before Quest 4 and Chapter 2 starts. Equipment is divided into the following types. Weapons, armor, heal potions. How to buy equipment. So yeah, buying of healing potions was something that was added in the 2021 remake for certain quest expansions in the Mythic tier, but yeah, the Japanese version had it first. How to buy equipment. Heroes that wish to buy equipment take the card they want, remove the cost of the equipment from the gold on their character sheet, and write the name of the equipment they bought in the equipment section. There is a limited amount of each piece of equipment at the shop. If many heroes all wish to buy the same piece of equipment, they should discuss who will get to buy it. They should consider who gains the biggest advantage from that piece of equipment. Some weapons and armor can only be used by some characters and not others. Further details are explained on the cards. So yes, this is the only version where that's explicitly the case, where the number of cards actually limit the number of instances of each item. In the first edition of the game, it was kind of implied but never stated. And the second edition, it was clarified that the cards don't limit it. Uh, North American version, there's an armory board. There's no equipment cards. And then the remake version, even though there's multiples of certain cards, it's just for fun. It's just for uh, those who wish to have a card by them when they're playing. So that was page 16. Now on to page 17, intermediate rules. Selling. And I think this may be the first version where they actually explicitly say that you can sell stuff back to the, to the armory or sell back equipment because in the European version, it's never really stated except you've got that potion of alchemy and the wizards of Morkar expansion that turns a piece of equipment into gold and you can sell the gold to get money. And then in the elf quest pack and barbarian quest pack, they say you can sell stuff, but yeah, before that it's, they don't really say it. So I think it may have occurred here first. Selling. The shop will buy equipment that is no longer needed for half its price. When selling equipment, return the card to the equipment pile and add half of its price to your character sheet. Trading. You may trade equipment you own for equipment a fellow hero owns. You can also sell equipment to other heroes or give it to them for free. Trading must be done before each quest begins. Okay, so that's so not mid-quest apparently. Weapons. Weapon cards list how many combat dice you should roll when attacking on them. Some weapons even allow you to attack diagonally or at a distance. Further details are explained on the specific cards. You can only own one weapon card at a time. When attacking, you can decide whether or not to use this weapon for the attack. So there they, there's limited carrying capacity apparently, at least for weapons. Weapons that can attack diagonally. Club, spear, short sword, etc. Projectile weapons. The crossbow can shoot arrows to attack enemies at a distance from you. There is no limit to the amount of times you can use the crossbow, but you cannot use it to attack enemies on squares surrounding you. When attacking enemies at a distance, you can hit any enemy you can see, no matter how far away they are. The combat procedure is followed as normal. The spear and hand axe may be used as normal weapons, but can also be used to attack at a distance by throwing them. Weapons are lost when thrown. Return the equipment cards for lost weapons to the pile. Armor. There are various types of armor, such as armor, helmets, cloaks, and so on. You can equip one of each at the same time. 
where some pieces of armor list things such as defense plus one, this means that you should roll one more combat die when defending. Below is an example. If chainmail, a shield, and a helmet are equipped, chainmail, defense three combat dice, shield, defense plus one combat die, helmet, defense plus one combat die, total, defense five combat dice. Note, chainmail and plate armor cannot be equipped at the same time. Also, you cannot wear two pieces of the same type of equipment at the same time. So when we were kids, <laughs> um, as a young child, I tried to cheat by saying, well, I'm just going to buy a bunch of helmets and take it to the blacksmith and he's going to hammer them into armor for me. Not seeing the logic that, you know, that, that uh, blacksmith is probably going to charge me money to do that work. And what's the point? So it's not really a, there's no solution. You just got to buy the equipment that works out. So don't try to cheat. Okay, page 18, continuing with the Japanese rules, intermediate rules. Heal potions. Instead of moving, heroes can choose to restore their stamina using a heal potion. Drinking heal potions bought at the shop restores 2 BP. However, you cannot surpass your max BP. You cannot give heal potions to another hero during a quest. When drinking a heal potion, write your new BP on your character sheet and return the heal potion card to the equipment card pile. So as you can see, in some ways the rules are a little more forgiving and some rules are more restrictive than other versions. Roman numeral four, level up. After each quest, heroes may attempt to level up by paying 500 gold. Seems like a lot, but actually when you think about it in this version, they give you, they give you a lot of gold. You have, there's lots of opportunities to acquire gold, more so than the other versions. If heroes level up, their max BP increases by 1. If they fail to level up, their max BP does not change. The 500 gold is not returned. The conditions for leveling up are as follows. Warrior and Dwarf. Roll four combat dice, and you level up if you roll two or more white shields. Magician and Elf. Roll three combat dice, and you level up if you roll two or more white shields. You have reached the end of the intermediate rules. That was page 18. Page 19. Now finally we're into the advanced rules. So here we get the, the whole uh, enchilada, as they say. Chapter 3, final chapter, advanced rules. In Chapter 3, the heroes become more powerful, but the heroes also continue to level up. To play Chapter 3 in the final chapter, players must learn the advanced rules. Gameplay under the advanced rules. All cards are used. The basic rules of gameplay do not change from the intermediate rules, but in the advanced rules, the following rules are added. So now, on the forums, there was a discussion of, so does this mean that first aid and holy flame and healing are gone, or are they still there? Because those would seem to operate by totally different rules than the other magic. But I tend to assume that they meant to say the new stuff replaces it, but I guess you can argue either way. It's a little ambiguous. The magician and elf can now use advanced magic. Enemies are now considered obstacles that block projectile attacks and magic. You can now add optional rules. Roman numeral one, advanced magic. In chapter three, the magician and the elf can now use advanced magic. There are many different types of advanced magic. Use the 12 spell cards to unleash magic in whatever way you desire. Types of magic. Advanced magic is classed into four elements of magic based on the magic's energy source. Earth magic, defense and healing magic. Water magic, defense and healing magic. Air magic, attack magic. Fire magic, attack magic. There are three spell cards for each magic element. Choosing magic. In each quest, the magician can use magic from three elements. The elf can use magic from one element. Before starting a game, the elf first chooses one element and takes that element's three spell cards. Then the magician takes the remaining three spell cards for the other three elements, making nine cards in total. So yeah, it's different than the other versions where the wizard gets first pick, then the elf, then the wizard takes everything else. So here the elf gets to make sure he gets uh, what he needs. 
Casting magic. During their turns, the magician and elf can cast magic once instead of entering combat or searching. You can choose the magic you wish to use from the spell cards you hold. Each magic can only be used once during each quest. Once the magic's effects fade, discard the card of the magic you used. Magic can only be cast on yourself or a target you can see. Also, you cannot cast magic on a target when there is an enemy in the way between you and the target. So that's page, page 19. All right, page 20, advanced rules. Roman numeral 2, using projectile weapons and magic. Under the advanced rules, if there is an enemy figure between you and your target in a passage, it becomes an obstacle, and you cannot use projectile weapons or magic. Allied figures are not considered obstacles. When in a room, you can use projectile weapons and magic on any target without restriction. See diagram 4 for an example. So there's diagram 4. All doors are open. So you got the hero circle there, front of the door. Allies, A, B, C. Enemies, 1, 2, 3, 4. In a situation like this, magic cast on allies can be cast on yourself or allies A or B. Attacks using magic and projectile weapons can only be used on enemies 1 and 2. If a line drawn between you and the enemy would pass through an enemy, they are considered an obstacle. When it is doubtful whether or not an enemy is in the way, the Demon King holds the final decision. Number three, uh, Roman numeral three, optional rules. By adding these rules, clearing quests becomes much more difficult. If you wish to have a more full-fledged role-playing game experience, try adding the following conditions. I think this is the only version that has optional rules. So I guess that's like Warhammer Quest, where you can decide to add extra rules for complexity or not. So optional rule one, conditions for obtaining treasure. If a room has monsters in it, you may not obtain any treasure. If there are monsters in a room, you cannot obtain treasure from treasure chests or hidden treasures. To obtain the treasure, you have to either defeat all the monsters in the room or wait for them all to leave. Monsters cannot open treasure chests. Optional rule two, conditions for searching. If there is a monster in an area to be searched, it cannot be searched. By adding this rule, when a hero wants to conduct a search, they must defeat all the monsters they can see first. Also, the Demon King may consider tactics such as sending many monsters in a room containing a hidden treasure. However, it will become impossible to avoid traps placed at the entrances of rooms containing monsters. Diagram 5. So this is a very harsh rule for the heroes. And see, like other versions, there's Diagram 5. In a situation like this, the hero cannot avoid the trap. So even if you know there's a trap on the other side of the door, well, I guess if you know there's one, you could try to jump it. But if it's if it's hidden, you can't search for it outside the door. So you're just going to fall in if you walk through. Harsh, but true. You've reached the end of the rules. Page 20. So there you go. So that's, uh, that's the end of that. But there is a little bit more. So this is page 21 of the Japanese rule book here. Rules of play. To the one taking up the role of the Demon King. Some players may dislike playing a villain, such as the dark demon king Grimdead. Not to mention the annoying role of game facilitator that comes with it. So, here is an explanation of the right way of enjoying the role of the dark demon king Grimdead. Whatever may happen, the demon king knows every secret of every dungeon and can freely control every monster, so he is like a god in the game. If the demon king felt like it, he could easily murder all of the heroes. However, you shouldn't think like that. The true joy of playing the Demon King is to entertain the heroes. How you can help the heroes have an exciting adventure should always be on your mind. Your goal is to freely aid them. By doing that, you'll soon realize that you're enjoying the game as well as the heroes. The main points are as follows. Understand the rules well. Don't drop hints without thinking. Don't concentrate attacks on one hero. Try and trick the heroes into danger. Try your best not to kill the heroes. Give fitting ad-libs as necessary. For example, the orcs ran away in fear. Also, the ultimate way to enjoy the game is to make up custom dungeons. This is a special privilege given only to the Demon King. 
feel free to photocopy the blank map attached and use it. When making a dungeon, remember these warnings. Check how many items of furniture are in the game. For example, there are only three treasure chests. Once you've made a map, try placing the furniture and see how it looks. Don't add too many monsters. It'll take a very long time to clear the quest. Don't make the dungeon too complicated for the same reason. Be careful about where you set up traps. If you don't find yourself in a situation, so you don't find yourself in a situation where if the dwarf dies, the rest of the heroes can't escape the dungeon. Try your best to be the greatest demon king you can be. Farewell. I like that. <laughs> that little uh, pep talk. Now, in the European version, they had the adventure design kit, which gave kind of tips on how to how to be more car with a game uh, game master. But I like how they worded it there. So this is the only version where they explicitly tell the GM not to try to kill off the heroes, to try to be a facilitator, entertainer, and so forth. Whereas in the other versions, I mean, <laughs> you're you're competing, you're trying to kill the heroes. But uh, some GMs decide to play that way anyway. Who's to know? So there's the, the famous blank quest map. Is that right set up? Yeah. So classic. And really that is one of the best parts of HeroQuest is the customizability and they encourage you from the beginning. And then there's a nice glossary. So you've got adjacent squares, advanced magic, advanced rules, armor, attack, attack power, beginner magic, beginner rules, body points, book of adventure, bot, BP, body points, CD, combat dice, character sheets, Character boards, collapse, combat, combat dice, custom dungeons, damage, dead ends, deciding rules, defense, defense power, doors, end of quest, end of the game, equipment. You get all the page numbers there. Heal potions, hidden doors, hidden treasure, intermediate magic, intermediate rules, legendary treasure, level up, beginner magic, intermediate magic, advanced magic, maximum body points, maximum mind points, mind points, monster cards, movement, movement distance, MP, mind points, Open treasure chest, optional rules, party, pit traps, placement, projectile weapons, quest, quest book, quest rules, revival, screen, search, surrounding squares, trap activation, trap treasure chest, traps, treasure, uh, excuse me, trap search, treasure, hidden treasure, open treasure chest, treasure search, treasure cards, treasure cards, treasure search, turn order, weapons, what can be seen. To customer who purchase, thank you for purchasing our product. If you have any questions about the product, sorry to trouble you, but please contact the customer service center. And there they give the classic Takara customer service center. I, no guarantee if you call that number, it'll still work, but that that was the information. And I can't necessarily pronounce all those correctly, but there you go. Nice of them to provide that information. I really think that Hasbro ought to release the remake Hero Quest in Japan. I'm not sure if there's a fan community still there, but I think they deserve it as much as anybody else. That was page 23. And check this out. This is really cool, I thought. So on the back cover, there is a map. Now, of course, the uh, the Warhammer fantasy world that uh, inspired Hero Quest, I think it was third edition, they had a map, uh, Return of the Witch Lord, and the um, European version of, um, yeah, Return of the Witch Lord expansion pack had a map on the back, which was taken directly from Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Um, or was it Warhammer Fantasy RPG? Yeah, Warhammer Fantasy Battle, because that was first. Well, but this map, I'm not sure if this has any equivalent in Warhammer, but it's pretty cool. So you've got the different locations from the quests. So Pain, Fortress of Pain, Ruins of the Way, Biala, Fortress of Digos, Ushiel, Yush, White Mountain, there's the island of Neef, Godo, oh, so that's where the king of Godo is, Lask, Spirit Valley, the Frozen Ocean, Recarm, the Black Mountain, Star Lake, there's a mystery there. Uh, Laidal, Fien, Zaus, Compass Rose, of course. Kingdom of Grimdead. So uh, just in the lore, thinking like, okay, so Zargon has a stronghold. Or this is actually where he's located. So if you, you're actually marching on Zargon's or Morkar's 
Grim Dead's uh, kingdom itself. Interesting. Snow Island. So yeah, so there's the map. So it's cool that they included that. And if you go through the quest book, you'll actually see those locations I'm talking about. There's 14 quests, and they're based loosely on the 14 quests from the game system, but there's quite a few differences. I think there's like a couple of quests that are similar, but a lot of them are just brand new. And some of the names get recycled, but they're, but they're actually different. Now this part is just uh, what Hispazargon did. So all credit to him for doing this particular arrangement and credit of course as he gives to the original translators and there are people that provided feedback of course day dallas kurgan i Careth. familiar names there and of course aaron b baba blue sun uh fen rear 79 jackie x and of course thanks to milton bradley games workshop and all the original hero quest design teams for creating this great and legendary board game it's for personal use only so again this is just me reviewing this for fun making comments um no infringement of any kind is intended it's all made to be fair use and then this was just his bizarre did this to show that his revisions so it's cool stuff so yeah for the japanese version of the game there's also the quest book there's also the character sheets, the character boards, uh, the cards, which would be legendary treasures, and the monster cards, which have gold values on them. So it's all, uh, it's, all, it's all pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. I mean, if I could get a copy of the Japanese Hero Quest in my hands, that'd be so awesome. But good luck. That's going to be an extremely rare uh, collectible. But this just gives you a sense of, of what the rules were like for that version. Again, interpreted um, by fans. So anyway, just wanted to share that. It's a pretty cool thing. So thanks once again for joining us on HeroQuest Fans. I hope you can catch us on the replay, which will be posted on YouTube, probably by the time most of you see this. But thanks once again, and we'll have to catch you next time. We haven't had a live game in quite a while. I'm hoping that possibly over the holidays we can do that, but it all depends on really if... Uh, you know, who, who decides to play and if people don't mind themselves being recorded playing a game. But we'll see what we can do. And we'll fill you in with future videos as those get done. All right, everybody take care.